Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? So I call this, shall he find faith or evidence of true and simple faith? And directly, I want us to bring out three things from here. Here we can directly see the mark of a Christian, of a child of God. That's one. Then two, we can directly see that they are, they will have trials in this world. So the first thing we see here is the evidence of being a true Christian, one, two, the trials that the Christian go through, And three, the trials are things that make them seek God, turn to God for help. Evidence of a true Christian. Christ says, I tell you, we avenge us speedily. He says, and shall not God avenge his only leg that cry unto him their night. So, so the evidence of a true Christian is obvious in the sense that this woman, in this picture, due to the trouble she's going through, that is seeking intervention from God, has made up her mind that, number one, I have a God that can solve this thing for me. So she goes on a consistent, she's consistent on seeking God's help for that thing. The woman is a picture of a Christian. The judge, on judge, judge is a picture of God. And that persistent woman is the picture of the Christian. We have two direct examples. This is all over the Bible. Abraham, for once, is a Christian. He was called to leave his town. His place of abode in Genesis 12, and he obeyed not knowing where he was going. God gave him a bundle of promises. He was childless. For decades, he walked with God. But he did God's bidding. He had trials or troubles of tribulation because he had to live with God's promises for years. The same thing happens to Isaac. Isaac was barren, even though God had promised him and his father. But there are two persons I want us to zero in on. This is, the, this is all of our scriptures. The children of God hang on God. The evidence that we are a Christian is, are we hanging on God? Does God play any role in our life? Do we miss anything when our week goes by? We don't open the Bible. We don't read it. We don't meditate on it. Are we missing anything when we don't do that? If we don't, something is wrong. If we don't take a week or a few days and see God in prayer, are we missing anything? If you are not missing anything, something is wrong with your Christianity. Because the evidence of our faith is found in us holding on to God. Not just in the time of trials. The trials will be there. But in the midst of those trials, we are still holding on to God. And we are constantly calling on him. Calling on him. Calling on him. The reality of the fact is, in the light of God's promises, in the light of God's love to us, we are going to have trials. The fact that the world hates us as Christians is a trial on its own because we cannot be like the people of the world and be children of God. So we go through this form of trials. So again, the three things we notice in this passage, we see the evidence of faith, 
children, the people that belong to God, hang on to God. They seek him for help. They seek him. They seek him. Hebrews 11. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because he who believes, he who comes to God must believe that he is and is a reward of them that diligently seek him. That is the evidence of a true faith. When our life is based on our own human knowledge and the thing that God says does not really play any role, even though we love to go to church, we love to identify with Christians, but we know within ourselves, God's word and his authority plays no role in our life. We personally do everything to ensure that we are the ones in authority in our life, not God. Then I'm here to tell you, my brother, my sister, you are not a Christian. You don't believe in Christ. You are not depending on Christ. If he comes today, he will tell you, you know, I don't know you. Let's forget the pretense. You don't belong to me. We all know. But we can change that today by calling on him. That's where, that's why we hear the word of God. The basis of God's word is, it's like a mirror that we should use to look at ourselves so that we can make amends. Because as long as you wake up every day, Christ is still available for you to receive in your heart. As long as we wake up every day, he's still there waiting for us to call on him to save our soul. Let's look at two examples and we'll see a better picture of these three things. The evidence of a true Christian, the trials they go through and how they might navigate their trials to seek God. An example is Anna in First Samuel, the mother of Samuel, it amazes me about this woman's faith. And I, I encourage us to read her story. Married to her husband that she loved so much, she was barren. The man was compelled to have another wife. And that one was fruitful like anything. And she went through so many trials because of her childlessness. Under the Old Testament, from the example of Sarah and Rachel, Jacob, Sarah, let's, first of all, let's talk with Sarah. Sarah was barren for years, convinced Abraham in Genesis 16 to take him a servant as a surrogate. That is biblical, that is culturally legal for them. But Anna never took that option. She chose to go every opportunity to the house of God to pray. In the Jewish culture, they went every year to Jerusalem and she went to Shiloh, the house of God, to pray. It was obvious. She was known there because early the prophet noticed her again and again. Now, if a Christian is going through barrenness or you are going through trials, you try the business and you had a setback. And those things, those trials, or it's a health issue, or you know, and why are these things there? Because We believe in God's promises. The book of Psalms says, children are the heritage of the Lord. We believe in God's promises and we expect that God should help us, give us victory, victory in our issues, in our trials. But sometimes God allows those trials to Show us our faith, where our heart belongs. When a Christian is going through some of these things, and within him is questioning God's faith,
faithfulness. That's a short thing that that person has not grabbed the real faith. He has not really accepted Christ, understood what repentance and faith is. Because as it were, there is one thing we must see in Christ Jesus. Very important for us. The very God himself. We serve one God that reveals himself in three persons. Father God and Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. So God the Son becomes a man. The highest form of humiliation. As expressed in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. He leaves his riches and glory in heaven. Comes down to become a man. That's the first humility. The second humility, he goes to the temple to teach. And as he was teaching, they began to castigate him. They began to attack him. To the point that he decided to begin to speak in parables. When we read Matthew 13, the parable of the sower, Jesus says they expressly, he speaks to the public in parable, and he speaks directly to his disciples. So they began to attack him, looking for a way to get rid of him. So in order for him not to be, probably to complete his three and a half years, he began to speak in a coded form publicly. They lied against him. They preferred a criminal to him. Another form of humility. The people that called him, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Just seven days ago, began to shout, crucify him, crucify him. A national betrayal, a national humiliation. He dies and rises and says our sins are forgiven. So let's look at this. Let's look at the journey. He leaves his glory in heaven. His God, his Godship becomes a man. Walked with his father for 30 years. Went through so many people that plan to defraud. And he teaches us, leaves an example of a godly life. Dies. For our own sins, Christ lived a sinless life, completely sinless life. The Bible says God made him to be sin who knew no sin. I want us to understand again, Christ did not commit any sin. He was made sin in a form of substitution, just like we did not do anything good. Christ physically did not commit any sin. Anybody that says Christ committed any sin should open the scriptures and tell you where it is recorded that he did. The whole, every account of his life showed he lived a righteous life. But he is substitutionally declared to be sinful in a substitutionary way. He himself did not commit any sin. So let's ask ourselves, if really we feel entitled, what glory have we left for God? What are the things we have left for God? Christ left his glory in heaven to become a man. What are the things we have left for God? He died a painful death. Which pain have we gone through for God? Now, let's ask again. God the Father seen God the Son going through all this. How do you think he feels?
but he allowed all of it for you and I. He took our place on that cross. And the only place we can prove our faith in him is when we understand that my barrenness, my sickness, my financial challenge in my bid to feed my family. I must not see God as unfaithful. Those things are not signs that I should look at and say, God is unfaithful in this area. Why is it happening to me? Another reason why those things are heavy trials to us, we have been erroneously educated. One reason why those trials happen to us is, and they tend to weigh us down, is because we have been erroneously educated about Number one, our understanding of what Christ has come to do for us. Christ did not die on the cross and rise for me to be financially wealthy, for me to have physical cash. He died to make me spiritually rich in him. And he died to reconcile me to him so that that reconciliation will bring out the blessings from within him. Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, his divine power had given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Ephesians 1, I think verse 3. Excuse me, I think it's First Peter. I'm not so sure now. But that's what the Bible says. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. The same thing Paul says in um, um, First Corinthians, all things are yours because you belong to Christ. Christ sees us right now in himself, but a one-sided love is no love. God's love must grow in our heart as well, if indeed we have been saved, except we are having lip service. And the evidence of God's love growing in us is in the midst of the trials you are going through, you can still rejoice and go to God in prayer on a daily basis. And even the trials aside, you still seek and desire to know him. Because this world will keep getting crazier and crazier. They will keep getting things, will keep turning upside down against the standards and beliefs of God. And where do we stand in respect to those things? We prove our love for God. In spite of those things by seeking him. And it's important for us to get the daily signals. Another important thing, the scriptures promise us peace in Christ. The scriptures tells us we will go through tribulations, Act 14, 22. We will through more tribulation enter the kingdom of God. James 1. James a servant of God to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad greetings. Those tribes were scattered because of persecution. And James continues, verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Next verse, knowing this, that the trial of your faith walk at patience. Next verse, let patience have a perfect walk. So that you might be perfect and the entire wanting nothing. The trials we go through are evidences of our faith in God. Just like Anna went through the trials and sought God and prayed and prayed and prayed. And backed her prayer with a vow. She was so bent on giving God's glory. I'm sure she must have been pleading 
the psalm that says children are the heritage of the Lord. I believe, I wouldn't say I'm sure, I believe she must have been pleading the scriptures on a consistent basis until God by spirit sent the prophet of God to give her a word of confirmation. May God grant you the prayers of your heart. I find Anna so interesting. She was, I don't know, maybe Eli said, take away your drink. Somebody saw her praying and said, why are you drinking? Why, why do you have the habit of drinking and coming to the house of God? She said, I'm not, I'm not drunk. I'm pouring my heart out before God. I guess she must have been mumbling some things. She was so hell-bent on getting an answer from God that nothing else disturbed her. This is exactly the faith. That's exactly this woman. Because the picture is, she's so persistent. She's so persistent. Our persistence. And somebody will say, when you pray for something once, more than once you have no faith. That's a big lie. We need a lot of understanding and wisdom in God's word. There's something in our, par in our passage that seems like a paradox. There is, there is nothing paradoxical about God's word. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which crown to him day and night, though he be along with them? So this verse 7 says, Will not God, will God not answer those that call on him day and night, even though it seems to delay? Verse 7, I tell you, we will avenge them speedily. Verse 8. So verse 7 says, even though God delays, won't he avenge, won't he answer their prayer? Verse 8, I tell you, he will do it speedily. Though God seems to delay, the next verse, I tell you, we do it speedily. That's no paradox. That speedily is an idiomatic expression that God rewards that consistency. And is, as far as he is concerned, he's going to answer it speedily in his own time. Because he makes all things beautiful in his time. As children of God, we must never fail to understand one thing about God. I was born early 70s. I'm aging. Our God was never born. He's never aging. He, he lives outside of time. Outside of time. Maybe that's why the Bible says a day is like a thousand years before God and a thousand years a day. God does not live in time. God does not live in time. He lives in eternity. We need not forget that. That's number one. Number two, God sees. Almost six billion people on earth. God's attention is on each and every one of his children calling on him. It's not as if God has angels that attends to his children. He himself sees millions of billions of times because he's a spirit, he's not a physical being. He's not limited by time and space. And the interesting thing about Anna that proves her faith in God is her son, her first son, became the greatest prophet in Israel, Samuel, became one of the greatest prophets in Israel. This is how faith plus barrenness leads to Samuel doing something spectacular for God. We too can do something spectacular on God's calendar of things when we understand that. It is needful for us to seek him in our life. 
let those trials, whatever it is, be reasons for us to see God. Let us understand that God has been good to us up till now, and he will continue to be good. Let us also understand that as Christians, this world is not our home. As far as faith is concerned. So when the people of the world are cherishing the things of this world and use them as a yardstick to glorify God, when a church goer praises God because his account is fat, he has the wrong priorities. He has the wrong reasons and motive for praising God. Because the Bible says that which is highly esteemed by among men is an abomination to God. He might be praising God for the wrong reason. But when a child of God has gone through years of barrenness and he continues, turns his back on any temptation to get that child through other means like Abraham did and listen to took the advice of his wife in Genesis 16. And that person continues to seek God, to seek God. That person will rejoice when he sees a Samuel or a Samuel, as it were, the answered prayers come because it will definitely come. Because the honor of God is involved. He's forever faithful. And again, the basis of our trust is shouldn't even be on those things. This is the lesson Abraham passed. Genesis 22, after he has had Isaac, God now tells him, and the Bible is very graphic. It says, the Lord now tested Abraham and said, take your son, go and sacrifice him. And he obeys and does everything. Hebrews writes and says, Abraham knowing that God will raise him from the dead because that is the seed person through which he's going to fulfill his promise. So Abraham knew that God was going to raise him from the dead. God wants us to look at this passage of scripture as always, let it be a mirror to us. So that we can see things that are wrong with our face. We can correct it. We can see things that are wrong with our spiritual face. With our spiritual appearance. The way we are. And correct it. God's word is meant. So. Do we have an attachment to God? Like Anna did. Even in, the spite of, in spite of our all. We live life on our own. If we are not connected to God in any way, God sees our hearts. He sees everybody. If you know you are not, you don't have a relationship with God, call on him today to save you. Because it is expedient. He is going to come back. To reward the saints and punish the disobedient. He definitely will. Otherwise, his death on the cross is of no use. There is one thing that is certain for us that are going through trials. Christ will definitely answer your prayers. Either in his second coming or in this world. As long as you don't lose your faith. And for those that are pretending to be children of God when they know they are not, Christ will come and he will reward their disobedience with punishment. So we basically need to choose on whose side of Christ we are going to be. Right now, we are in the time of grace. 
We are in the time of grace. So the call to repent is a daily thing. Time is gone. In Mark 10, there's a story of a young man, God willing, we were examining. But it's a very similar to Anna, the man named Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus. I think Bartimaeus means a blind man. So he must have been, probably his family were blind. But this man heard that Jesus was passing from Jericho. And he simply said, ah, today, God, this Jesus that I've heard him feed multitudes, he can open my eyes. And he became so persistent and began to shout. We can read Mark 10, 46 to 52. Lord, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, that son of David. There is one thing that occurred to me now. When we look at the trials we are going through, we really see sometimes when we want to focus properly, we'll be seeing the goodness of God in those trials. We'll be seeing them. And I want us to know that God is faithful. God has a plan. For every child of his, God has a plan. The end game is for him to take us to heaven. And in between, he wants us to trust him and focus on him. And if he believes that he needs to bring us closer to him, let me tell us something. When God cannot reach you through his word, he will use the external means, which is more painful. So the closer we get to God in him speaking to us and us hearing and obeying, the easier our life will be. Some of the times, 50% of the trials we go through, God is trying to draw us closer. Draw us closer to himself. Sometimes we are naive. Sometimes we are not watchful. Sometimes we simply let off our guard. We are told from the word of God. Our duty is daily prayers and meditation on the word of God. So that we can continue to renew our mind. Ephesians 6, Paul ends by saying, Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And he lists a few things we need to do. We need to continue every, every time to strengthen ourselves against sin and disobedience. And the basic thing is we need to use the armor of God. Time won't permit me to go there. But the opportunity for us to use those armor are the trials. And we read Acts 14, 22, the saints there were told we must through more tribulation and tie to the kingdom of God. What does it mean? We, we go through trials. We go through trials because we don't belong to this world. And the more we get rich in Christ, the more we relate with God, the more we understand David the more we experience Psalm 23 for ourselves, not just 23 verse 1 for ourselves. The Lord is my shepherd that shall not want. The more we become his sheep, the more he guides us to where our green pasture is, to where we'll be able to lie down and find peace. The more he does that for us. Because indeed, that's his plan to keep us closer to him. So that in sickness and in health, we are his. In blindness and with children, we are his. In poverty or in wealth, we are his. Even though we are rich in Christ Jesus, we only focus on our trials and our accounts, the physical money you have access to, that you believe you have. The spiritual money and the influences that God can bring your way 
are not in our focus. Hence, we do not trust in God. Because physically, before Christ fed the multitude, he had nothing. But Christ did not doubt. When he told them, these people are hungry, we can't send them away fasting. There was nothing. The more we develop the mind of Christ, the more we stop seeing ourselves in the light of things available to us physically, the more we are able to key into the spiritual and have peace. Because even though you don't have that money in, the, in, in cash, God is the owner of the cattle on a thousand years. Translate it to physical. God can make that money available. But our mind, so you see, sometimes because we are not closer to God, and some of these trials are the things we use, God uses to bring us closer. Because the more we develop his mind, the less of these trials we see. Because some of these trials are even a perspection, a, a, our own view, our own perception of the issue. The evidence of faith is holding on to God, seeking God in the midst of whatever it is we are going through. So you are having issues in your home. Why don't you allow God's word reign in the home? Must you be the dictator in the home? God didn't give you your home for you to be a dictator. At least you are a Christian. Why not allow God's word? Yes, God's word. My dear brother, yes, you are a Christian. Thank God for that. God didn't call you a dictator. He said, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Christ was not shouting on the church. Christ was not verbally abusive. So learn from that. That means those things are not love. Those two things I've mentioned. Go and learn from Christ how to Christ love the church. And God bless you, my dear sister. Everything God forbids in his word. Wives submit to your husband. It's what you do. You're abusing, you're insulting. That's not submission. Let God's word reign. That's the evidence of being a Christian. If we claim to be Christians and God's word is not having his way in our heart and in our life, okay, it's only those that would puddle us that would tell us we are Christians. If we want to hear the truth, we are not. Until God's word, God has his way in our heart and in our life, we are not Christian. And again, God's word is for you to make amends. If the word hits you anywhere, it's not coming from me. I don't write the mail. I just deliver it. The mail is not from me. It's from the Bible. The word. So let the spirit walk in you and make amends so that you can enjoy his peace. I pray that will be all our portion. In Jesus' name.